Thank you. But let's get some friendships to going on this one, okay? Let's work this felony thing. I want a conservative Republican and a liberal Democrat, and I want to end the political nonsense, and let's get together and solve a problem together, okay? That's what I'd like to see. Okay, I'm also very proud of Ohio's mental health director, Tracy Plouk. This lady is something. She's executing a plan that will reform our mental health system which means we will not need to build more buildings at the expense of our clients. At the same time, we can reduce operating expenses for the taxpayers of our state. And let me tell you what the story is. There was some sort of an informal commi commitment to build a building in downtown Cleveland. We have a mental health facility in Northfield, just across the border, Summit County. Tracy came to me and said, we have a current dilapidated facility in Cuyahoga County. We, we were there all the time, emergency. It's a building has fallen apart. But John, if you allow me to take and renovate the Summit, the Northfield facility in Summit County and not build the building in Cleveland, I will have no need for any capital improvements over the next four years and I can save $4 million a year in operating expenses. And she went up to see the mayor. You know, I know Frank Jackson and I at some point are going to have some big blow up, but you know, I got to tell you, he's a terrific man. He's got a great heart. You know, he's an executive, taking my kids to see him. I want him to go sled riding down there in Cleveland Stadium. He, he didn't have the guts for that one, but that's okay. <laughs> but Tracy had to go see the mayor, and I had to call the mayor and say, Mayor, I can't do the building because I got to put the mentally ill first. The mayor said, I understand, but there's other things that we do for Cleveland because we want to rebuild it. So in this case, we reduce operating expenses, we save money on capital improvements, <laughs> and the people who are mentally ill are better taken care of. We don't do that very often, and we're going to learn from it. Greg Moody, you know, I don't know how this cabinet ever came together. I, I, it's just amazing to me. The guy takes a giant pay cut. His wife's a minister. She said, I know where your heart is, Greg. You've got to go work for him. I'll do double prayers. Um, he's our director of health transformation. I decided to create it. And think about this. We have this Medicaid program, and he's designed a, this whole uh, business of home health care. Think about this. We had Medicaid separated into six separate divisions inside the state of Ohio. One of them, by, way, by the way, was located in the Department of Aging. And our director said to us one day, she said, I have a half a billion dollars of Medicaid funding inside of my budget, and I want to give it up because it doesn't make sense for it to be there. I was lucky I didn't break my arm when I fell off my chair. <laughs> you never hear this. But the team has worked together, and Greg has assembled them. And we're making great strides in Medicaid. And I, and I want to explain to you that the Medicaid proposal we are going to come with, it's very far-reaching. It's very reform-oriented. It's forward-looking. It's the kinds of things that we all say we ought to do because it makes sense. We don't have to have a person run to an emergency room if we can have somebody available, a primary care doctor, to take care of them in the middle of the night. You know how much money that saves, and you know how much more humane it is? You ever sat in an emergency room? <laughs> how about, uh, you know, if we have a program that says we ought to coordinate care? You remember when you took your mom into the hospital, and she was in there for three or four days, and when she checked out, she signed the paperwork, they pushed the wheelchair like they did to my mother-in-law to the curb, and she gets in the car and doesn't know what, what's next. How about if we coordinate her care? and direct her to the setting where she can have the best treatment. See, that's the kind of thing that makes sense. Let me tell you what Greg is thinking about here. We're going to do a better job taking care of low birth weight babies by taking better care of their mothers. Low birth weight babies.
tell you what we're talking about. Low birth weight babies face serious health risks. And I know my kids come out at 4'2 and 4'4, my sweet Emma and Reese. But they weren't the really low birth weight babies because they got to go home. But the ones that have those serious health risks, they incur six times the cost as other babies. And by the way, Robbie Nichols, my press secretary, had a little baby boy yesterday, Carson, seven pounds. He's, uh, he's not one of those. Uh... But we need to understand that low birth weight is a trend that tends to repeat itself. Now, I think we can help these mothers and their babies by staying in touch with them. And how about give them the prenatal care they need so that we don't have more low-weight babies born. We, can take, we can't solve it all, but we certainly can solve some of it. And with just a little extra effort, we can make life better for the most vulnerable Ohioans by also giving taxpayers better value and making Medicaid more sustainable. Well, we need to think outside of the box on Medicaid. And if we do work together, we can be forward thinking. Education. K through 12 and post-secondary, of course, it's critical to our economic future. But I want to tell you, more choice, more accountability, more dollars in the classroom instead of bureaucracy will improve our schools. And we are going to have a significant reform agenda. By linking our education system with business opportunities, commercializing more products from our universities, letting our professors' research team own a piece of what they invent, it's going to improve higher education. All of these reforms are going to make us much stronger. We've got a report. 63,000 unfilled jobs in Ohio. You meet with these CEOs and they say, we don't have the workers. We don't have the skills. Diebolt put a, uh, a part of their operation on the campus at Stark State to train them. I was at Honda last week. Honda needs flow. They need people who can make sure that robots are working all the time. But we, don't, we have not been able to connect both K through 12 and the vocational education and the higher education in our technical schools and community colleges and our universities to real stuff. We have to get that done. And we're going to work like crazy on it. I also want to tell you, was it Friday night or Saturday night, I had some dinner with my buddies, and I went out and bought the movie Waiting for Superman. I'm going to show this movie here in the state of Ohio. You watch this movie, it'll get you angry, it'll get you frustrated. It'll make you cry, and it will get you to begin to stand up for our kids when you have an opportunity. You see, I've, I've been in Harlem with Jeff Canada and see the struggle that goes on. When you see well, you don't have enough choice, and mothers, just like uh, that lady in Akron, she wasn't complaining about the education, but she wasn't sure her kids were going to be safe. She had no choice to go anywhere else, because the choice probably ran out or she was unaware of it. And then they put a ball and they do like a lottery. And they pick the ball out and I won and you lost. And I won and you lost to our kids? Shame on us. It's unacceptable. You deny a kid an education, a secure education, you're killing their future. Nothing should stand in our way of making an Ohio an ability to lead in this country and be able to compete in the world. And we better commit ourselves to this and get this fixed.